right? And so we want to thank him for being here this morning. Thank you guys for being here. For those of you online, thank you for tuning in this morning because it's important that you start your week right, right? Important that you start your week rejoicing in the Lord. And so when I was asked to do the welcome this morning, I said, Holy Spirit, you speak to your people. I don't know. It's your people. I don't want to talk on behalf of you. I want you to talk through me. And I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us this morning, have a quiet reflection this week. I know with all the noises and the things that are happening around us, it can so often overwhelm us. But God wants you to take time out and be quiet in his presence. Tune out the noise. Tune out what is going on and press in to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Pressing to the God who knows everything, who knows that things that are happening around us are meant to happen. But through that, he is strengthening us <laughs> to trust in him. Yeah. You know, um, a few weeks ago, 43 of us went on this amazing, amazing tour. And it just, you know, it just um, brought home to me the multifaceted characteristic of God. Yeah. How good he is. How awesome he is. How he works through his people to give, to make beautiful things. <laughs> We went to the Sistine Chapel and, and I looked up and I thought, oh my God, this is awesome. This is awesome. You are awesome in all your works. And to see the difference between Europe and with the West is so, I was telling Siobhan this morning that God created uniqueness. He created us in his unique image, but then he creates similarities. He creates differences to see the differences that he's created. How wonderfully God is. We need to accept that. We need to reconcile ourselves to that. And so, again, as we go through this week, I want us to reflect on God's goodness. Look at nature. Look around you. We may not live in a part of the world that may have seasons where the leaves fall and change, but there are still things out there that we can observe and we can be grateful to God for. Amen. I want us to have hearts of gratitude as we go through this week. You promise that that's what's going to happen? C come on, guys. We serve a great, big, wonderful yes. God. And we need to start realizing that. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's just stand together as we look to the God who creates the universe, who creates the beauty and the wonder, the oceans, the seas, the architecture. Oh, my God, it's if you could only understand what God wants for us. And what's there for us to reach out and t grab, take a hold of. Just quiet our hearts before him this morning. And look to him. Because he's awesome. He's magnificent. He loves us. He wants only what's good for us. So thank you, Daddy. Thank you for this morning. Thank you that you still care and that you still love us. And despite what's going on around us, you're telling us every single day that you are with us and that all we need is to ask and you'll intervene. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us far above what we can ask or think. You said your love as far as the east is from the west and that's far. And so we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here today to worship you. Let's forget about ourselves. God, we are forgetting about ourselves. We are decreasing while you increase, Lord. Because we know that all things work together for us who believe in you and who trust in you and who look, those people who look to you. And so have your own sweet way today. Bless Brother James as he preaches God. Speak through him. 
May your words go forth with power and might and touch the heart. May we trade our sorrows, Lord, for your joy. Because the joy that you bring is our strength. And so, Father God, we thank you for today. And we lift you high above the heavens. And we pray through your only begotten Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, so put your hands together, guys. And we're going to worship God. Hallelujah. We're going to worship him as he deserves to be worshipped.
Are you glad that you can trade your sorrows? Because we serve a God who is mighty, who is above all, who's a God of wonders, he's a God of miracles, a God who is awesome. He's our Jehovah Jireh, he's our Jehovah Rapha. I need y'all to move this morning and get excited about the God that we serve. The word of God says that if we cast our cares on him, he cares for us, amen? Hello, amen. All right, just making sure we all here. Yeah. Get those feet moving. Father God, we thank you this morning that we can trust in you. Our entire faith is in you. Let's go sing it out. Say, Jehovah, you. I trust. I trust in you. In you. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Jehovah, you. I trust. I trust in you. Sorrow. 
So long to my fear, so long to my pain, so long to my sorrow. It's not welcome here. Goodbye, fear. Said you ain't welcome here. So long, so long to my trouble, so long to depression, so long to anxiety, so long to my pain, so long to the burden, so long to the stress. lift up that shout of praise this morning because we know he's the God who keeps his promises. Lord, we fix our eyes on you as the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, you keep us in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed on you. This morning, we fix our attention and our thoughts on you and you alone our hope and our strength, our redeemer, our strong tower, our salvation. You are the God of miracles.
thank you, thank you, thank you so much for who you are. There's not enough words, Lord. We just thank you. May you see our hearts this morning, knowing that you can see all things. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Come on, I know you can do better than that. Put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. I love the vamp. Through the storm, he is Lord. How many of you believe that this morning, that through the storm, Jesus Christ is still See, y'all not sounding convincing to me. I'm going to say that again. Through the storm, Jesus Christ is still... See, see that's too weak for me. I, I don't know if you guys even really believe that, so I'm going to do that just one more time. I said, through the storm, Jesus is still... Come on, somebody. I need for you to be fully convinced that through the storm, Jesus is still. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but God has just been too good for me to just sit back and not give him glory and praise. No matter what I go through, no matter what I've been through, I can still lift my hands and give God some praise. You know, oftentimes we come in here all bougie-fied, like we can't give our creator some praise. Sorry, I just, I, I, I've been through a lot these last two months. And, and God's grace has carried me through. And so, I don't know about you, how many of you know that oftentimes when we see God's hand move in such tremendous situations and testing and trials, we get to understand a deeper aspect of who He is. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. It's one of the pastors here at Metropolitan. I'm telling you, God has a sense of humor. I remember uh, rescheduling my preaching dates because uh, my family and I, my wife and I, just purchased a home uh, to, within these last two months. Thank you. For some of you that are clapping, you should have been helping me yesterday move. I'm joking, I'm joking, guys. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, so you should have told us, Pastor. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But God has a sense of humor because I remember changing the dates and saying, listen, that week, something with the scheduling, the contractor for our home, he was behind schedule. And so us moving into this home, it kind of set us back a little bit. And so I said to myself, I said, well, I got to change the dates because this is not going to work. I can't preach on the weekend that I have to move. So I changed the dates. And then Arthur came to me one day and he said, listen, uh, yeah. He said, Pop, Pop Gallimore said he could do July 3rd. You can't say no to Pop Gallimore. That's Pop Gallimore. You, you can't say no. I said, well, it is what it is. <laughs> So I was like, well, it looks like I'm still in the clear, like I can still move into the home, right, without having to preach that weekend. Some more stuff came up, and inevitably, I end up doing the very thing that I tried to avoid. The very thing that I tried to avoid. Preaching on the weekend that I had to move. But God's grace. (laughs) 
These last two months has been extremely trying on our family. But God has carried us through every single step of the way. Seeing God's hands move in just tremendous ways and, and seeing God just in the moments where I just feel like, I just God, I can't do this no more. His grace and his divine power kept me. And I was able to clinch the cross that much harder and say, God, thank you. And God showed me, James, it's not your strength. It is not your strength, but it's by my divine power that I installed in you. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can't do anything. It's important for us to understand we can't even bear fruit. We can't do anything without Christ. That needs to be a reality in our everyday living. We need Jesus more than ever. Hallelujah. All right, let's get to the sermon. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see your beautiful faces. Good to see you in the building. And I want to welcome those who are online. If you're chiming in, if you're online, I want you to type into the comment box, I'm here. So great to see you. We miss you and we love you and we hope to see you soon. For some of you, you may not know my name is James Hannah and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at Metropolitan Baptist Church. And it's always a great privilege to come together for us to fellowship. Uh, I want us to really understand this is that coming together is not a mundane experience. We need to understand that as we gather every Sunday, primarily, number one, it honors God. Amen. Every Sunday, when we gather together, it honors God. And number two, it's biblical. And number three, it strengthens us. It edifies us. It's encouraging. We need each other. This is not just some mundane, oh God, here we are, another Sunday. Understand that this moment where we come together, this is koinonia. This is deep-rooted fellowship in Christ. This is so important. So it's great to have you and it's great to see you. Amen. Of course, you guys already know, before I begin to dive into the Word of God, I always say this. This is my slogan. If you want to hear the Word of God, if you want to hear God speak to you today, if you want to hear the voice of God, you open His Word. His Word is the objective truth and principle of all life. We cannot govern ourselves accordingly without the Word of God. It is infallible, it is inerrant, and it is the very breath of of God that is alive, that transforms our hearts. So, as I always say, what Scripture says, what Scripture says, amen. Turn and swipe with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. I'm going to read for you today. And if you are there, I'm going to do this for a good friend of mine by the name of Clayton James, who's in the back. If you're there, I want to hear you say, I got it, Doc. Oh, that's a little weak. If you're there, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33, I want to hear you say, I got it, Doc. Yeah, yeah. There you go, Clayton. I did that one for you. He told me, James, why do you always do that? It's corny. I said, oh, well. <laughs> We grew up in my church, you know, you know, not necessarily in the Caribbean context, but in the black American church where we grew up, Doc was after everything. <laughs> Doc was like, what's up, Doc? <laughs> like, how you doing, Doc? <laughs> Doc was after everything. You're preaching, Doc. <laughs> I mean, it just became a part of our thing. 
<laughs> there it is. There it is, Doc. There it is. That's, see, there you go, Clayton. Booyah. All right, let's read. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33 says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. Neither they sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be, someone say, saying what you shall eat or what you shall drink, what you shall wear. For the Gentiles seeks, seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first <laughs> the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these things will be added to you. Today's sermon is about the antidote to anxiety. The antidote to anxiety. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for providing us another day to be alive. Thank you for granting us the breath that you provide. Thank you for allowing us to behold the glory of your creation once more again today. And dear God, we are still in awe of you. As we dive into your word, I pray that you will minister to our hearts. I pray that you will uh, transform us and create a deeper conviction to fix our eyes on you. Allow us to reorganize our life and let it be all about you. Dear God, we thank you. Forgive us for being anxious. and Give us the hope that we need in your son, Jesus Christ, to sustain us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I gave a testimony, these last two months has been extremely trying to our family. Uh, it almost seems as if everything was collapsing. Un unexpected things were popping up. I remember my wife and I we were in the room signing that dictionary of a contract for our home. And I remember in that moment, my wife and I were extremely excited. We got the key, we were like, yeah, we got our key, take picture selfies, bye. You know, we were like mad excited. Literally, not even two weeks later, yeah, uh, yeah, you have a, a, a few leaks in your roof, you have mold here, you got this, you got that. Like, blah, blah. I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what's happening here? All of these unexpected things begin to pop up out of nowhere. I mean, it was just overwhelming. And I began to think to myself, what is happening right now? I, I don't understand this. We talked to the inspector. He, he gave us some great news. Yeah, yeah, you have five more years on the roof and this and that and this and everything is all good. We're two weeks in and we already have to, <laughs> our pockets are already hurting. So I begin to, God, I need you more because this anxiety rush that I'm experiencing right now is overwhelming. How many of you have ever been in that place where you were overwhelmed by anxiety? So I began to think on these things, right? How many other individuals 
suffer with this anxiety. So I look up some statistics and I know Rosie may give some correction. These statistics may be wrong. She's a psychiatrist, I believe. Psychologist. Oh, I got to get it right now. I gotta, <laughs> we got to get it right now. <laughs> She's a psychologist. But I looked up some statistics and I'm going to run them down a little bit for you to really just understand how real anxiety really is. Anxiety is, number one, anxiety is the most common mental disorder in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults. Two, the prevalence by state of mental illness ranges from the lowest in Florida, 16.03%, to the highest, 2266 in Oregon. The majority of adults with anxiety have a mind of impairment of 43.5%. And 33.7% have a moderate impairment. And, uh, and, serious, and those who have serious impairment are 20, I'm sorry, 22.8%. Nearly half, uh, 47% of survey respondents experience anxiety on a regular basis. 19 million adults experience specific phobias, making it the most common anxiety disorder in America. 15 million adults have social anxiety. 6 million adults have panic disorders. Am I along, the, along those ranges, Rosie? Thank you. So you see, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we desperately need to dis something that can disengage us, something that can remove the plague of us, notice what I say, consistently living in anxiety. But I begin to think to myself and ask myself the question, do we truly understand what it means to follow Christ? Whether we know it or not, we live our lives thinking as if Christ is this psychological band-aid. Whether we know it or not, we just think that Christ is a, a psychological crutch or following him is just convenient when it's right. Or for some of us, we follow Christ because it just works for you. But do we truly understand that following Christ is having an understanding and a conceptual reality and truth that life without Christ is completely meaning, meaningless and without him we're nothing? Do we truly have an understanding and a conceptual reality of this truth? You know, as we begin to dive in verse 25, Christ gives the ant as we dive into chapter 6 of, from 25 to 33, Christ gives the antidote, the solution, I believe, that helps us and keeps us from living in anxiety. But before we begin to dive into verse 25 of chapter 6, I want us to understand the context because in verse 25 of chapter 6, Christ says, therefore. So I'm like, huh. Why is Christ saying therefore? He begins the verse in 25 with therefore. So I don't know if you're familiar with the laws of logic, but the syllogisms uh, is basically premise one, premise two, then conclusion. So Obviously, within the few verses above, within the entire context, Christ is giving God in flesh. I want us to pause a little bit, even with this understanding that this is God in flesh giving us a logical conclusion about life. Whoo! <laughs> he says, therefore. So, I want us to take some time to just do a brief thumbnail sketch, not a full exhaustive 
uh, expository examination of 19 verses 24, but I want us to really understand holistically what is going on in this thought process. So I want us to engage a little bit and go into the text and see what God, our King, is saying. So Christ begins in verse 19 through 21 with an imperative. So you're saying, what is an imperative? An imperative means a command. So whenever you sit here in the, or see in the context where it says do not or you should not, that is what we call an imperative. So I want us to pause for a second. This Imagine this, this is God, the creator of the universe, the creator of all things, who now comes into flesh and gives a command. He says, do not store up treasures upon the earth. He commands us not to value or store up materialistic things of this world, but to store up treasures in heaven. Christ now begins to give a series of illustrations on why we should not be materialistically driven. He uses the moth illustration and how the moth, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the early, in the eastern part around this particular time, clothing and garments were extremely valuable. And the moth, they were, he uses this illustration because around this particular time, there was something called a cloth moth. So the moth would now lay eggs on the clothing. And then it would give, the eggs will hatch into this little larva. And this larva now, within the clothing and the, garment, and the garments, begin to build little homes and eat away at the clothing. So Christ now uses this illustration of the moth and he also uses the illustration of rust, corrosion, and how it is interchangeable that things, that these things can be eaten away. Then he also uses the thief. The things that we gather, the things that we store upon this earth can be stolen. Now, on this particular day in the first century, Houses were made out of mud and clay. So whenever a person would try to steal into your home, they would, they would literally have to dig into your house with their fingers. Some say that people would actually dig tunnels underneath the home to get into the home. I can imagine just sitting there like, bro, what you doing? Like, you, you, like I can hear you, you know. I, <laughs> It's not like today, with our alarm system, we can, I can check, literally check on our phones and set alarm system on our phones and, and all of this great stuff. So he begins to use these series of illustrations. Now, what was the purpose of Christ using these illustrations? He did it to show that everything we gain in this world, everything that we gain in this world is susceptible to destruction, ruin, and decay. That we spend our whole lives gaining the American dream, investing our whole entire life in this world, gaining the bag and getting the biggest house and getting the biggest car or having the flyest clothing and all of these particulars. And Christ is giving these illustrations to let us know that these things are susceptible for destruction. So why are you wasting your time investing into this world? This is a humbling chapter. Christ now drives it in verse 21. He says this. Check this out. In verse 21 of, of Matthew 6, he says, He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
I'm going to say that again. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says it in verse 21. Essentially, what Christ is saying, he's saying is that everything that is of high value to us will be the very thing that has our attention and commitment within our lives. Everything that is of high value will have in our lives will have our attention and commitment. All right, so here's the thing. I'm going to... All right, I just want to give a disclaimer. I love my kids. I really do. Y'all know I, y'all know I love my kids. Y'all see me with my kids. I'm going to give this disclaimer. I love my kids. Okay? <laughs> okay? But there, there, there are times when I'm home, and for some of you who know me, you know I love video games. You know I love video games. Y'all know I love to play video games. Oftentimes, I'm sitting there, I'm playing my game. It has my undivided attention. I got to get this win, y'all. I can't lose. I, I can't lose. I got to get this win. So I'm playing the video game. It has my undivided attention. Little Junior, Daddy, I'm thirsty. <laughs> right now? Right, like right now? All right, son, give me a second. Daddy, I'm thirsty. I got you. I promise you. I got you. Just give me a second. I, for some millennials, you'll know what I say. It is the, is the, I felt like it's like the SpongeBob three hours later. <laughs> Daddy, I'm thirsty. <laughs> and then I realized it. So much time has passed by, I completely forgot something that was so valuable to me because something else had my attention. I wonder how many of us, how many things in our lives that has our attention and we're telling God, give me a second. For some of us, it's our careers. For some of us, it is the idea of wanting to be married. God, give me a second. I, I'll get involved in ministry, but I, I got to get married. You don't understand. I, I got to get married. For some of us, our, our bank account is look, looking a little too thin. I got to put some extra hours in. God, give me a second. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want us to really understand what's happening in this context here. This is so good. Then in verses 22 through, 30, through, uh, through 23, Jesus begins to unpack this a little more. He gives more illustrations, he says, of the eye. He says uh, in verse 24, oh, no, I'm not going to read, I'm sorry. But he begins to give the illustration of the eye and the body implying that where our focus is the most will determine the condition of our life. He uses the eyes as a gateway into our life, eyes to kind of depict the focus and the attention of where our life is, or where our life is. And that will determine the condition of our life. He says, listen, if your eyes are focused on God, then your life, your, your body will be full of light. But then if your eyes are focused on yourself, it will be full of darkness. Then he drives it home in verse 24. He says, he says this, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Here's the thing. I want us to understand this is the thought process of God right now in flesh. But he's also giving a reality check that here's the thing. That there is no neutrality when it comes to God. That if we are living our lives for ourselves, we are fully committed to ourselves, inevitably we are conveying that we are more valuable than God. 
You can't serve two masters. Oftentimes we live this Christian life assuming that we can just carry God on the, for the ride. Hey, what's up, God? Yeah, I'm going over here. Come on and join me. No. It's either you're fully committed to Christ or you're fully committed to yourself. There is no neutrality when you are a Christ follower. There is no in-between. There is no gray areas. It's either you are fully committed to God or you are fully committed to yourselves. Now that we have some understanding of the context, now we get to verse 25. Now we get to verse 25, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Note number one, or point number one is this. Living in anxiety is the result of a heart that is driven by self-preservation. Who? Why are you saying that? Because as we observe the previous text above, verses 25, in context, it is clear Christ continues to give imperatives. He wants us to understand that living in anxiety and worry conveys a lack of faith in him and who he is as God. Because our focus is not on him, but our focus is on ourselves and not the kingdom of Christ. Once we've become the center of our lives, then Christ. That is when we make, the, the, uh, that is when we make ourselves vulnerable in living in a state of anxiety. Because things are not going the way who? We want them to go. Why? Because we're driven by self-preservation. We're driven by self-preservation. It is important for us to see that this is not a text of comfort to the poor, but it, it reminds us not to depend on earthly material goods. Christ is commanding us, or Christ is commanding for radical disciples. Radical disciples. This is not a game. Christ makes it very clear. And to be personally honest, this completely destroys the whole prosperity gospel. That God always wants you rich. That God always wants you to be extremely wealthy. But we see it here explicitly in the text. Christ is saying don't invest or store up things upon this earth. Now, as a disclaimer, I'm not saying that we can't have healthy concerns and be responsible. The Bible does say that if a man doesn't work, he don't eat. But it's important for us to ask ourselves the question, what is the driving force of our existence? Is it to serve Christ or is it to serve our own ambitions? What is, what is the driving force of our existence? We're not existing to serve ourselves but we exist. I always say this. We don't exist to serve your... You're not here by random accident to fulfill your own personal desires and pleasures. You are strategically and specifically placed here to give yourself to God. That's it. Nothing else matters. If your life, if God and Christ and the kingdom is not the primary driving force of your existence, then inevitably we live our life in self-preservation mode, which we lapse into anxiety. Because who, who is always on our mind? Me. Interesting thing, I was speaking to my brother in California by the name, his name is Pastor Jimmy, we were having a conversation and he brought something to my attention. Anxiety within this particular text is not, is a negative connotation. But then he also brings up the positive usage of anxiety, the biblical definition 
of anxiety. So I'm like, this is interesting. The Bible uses anxiety in two different forms or, 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 or ways. But it's not what we think it is. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, Paul says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by good news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned. That word concern in the Greek is another term for anxiety. For your welfare. We're seeing where we're going here. We're seeing the biblical usage of anxiety. This completely destroys our whole personal perspective of what we should be worried for. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says this. He says, and apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me of anxiety for all the churches. Whoo! Can anybody guess where this is going? The biblical uses of anxiety? Of how we should properly be anxious? As followers of Christ, if we are to have anxiety or worry, it needs to be deeply and genuinely rooted in direct care for others. But when we allow ourselves to be consumed by anxiety that is driven by self, it takes our attention away from God and places it upon ourselves. Christ was informing that superficial drives of life and investment is not enough to sustain your life. Write this down in point number two. Point number two, God cares for you. Simple. God cares for you. Now we're getting to the good news. <laughs> Everything is good news within this text. But it's going to lighten up a little bit. Let's look at verses 26 through 32. God says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, but gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which, is a, which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to your lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. N they neither toil nor spin. Verse 29, he says, Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like these. Verse 30, But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the, into the oven, will he not uh, much more clothe you? O oh, you of what? See where it says? Mmm. Therefore, what is this called again? An imperative. He uses it again. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus uses a series of beautiful illustrations of how God's activity provides for nature and his creation that conveys a deep theological truth about his character that we will need to understand and know which will bring great comfort in our lives. In verses 26 to, uh, to 33, he reveals something of what we call providence. I'm going to explain what providence is, and I'm almost done, I promise you. Providence. Christ uses a series of illustrations of how he provides for nature. And I think this is so important for us to really understand this particular character of God, that God is providential, the providence of God. I like John Piper's definition. He uses this. He says, the word providence is built from the word provide, which has two parts, pro in the Latin, which means forward or on behalf of, vide in Latin means to see. 
So you might think the word provide would mean to see forward or to foresee. He says, but it really means to supply what is needed to give sustenance or support. He says, so in reference to God, the noun providence has come to mean the act of purposefully providing for or sustaining and governing the world. I want us to really understand this concept and aspect of God. That God is providential in your life. God cares for you. He is providential over all things. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Who is that? Christ. He is providential over the natural world. Oftentimes we're in this space of thinking that God is so far that He's really not involved in our reality. But it's very clear it says in, in Proverbs chapter 21, I mean, I'm sorry, in Psalms 104, chap, um, verse 14, it says, You cause, which is God, the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for the man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth. We see this? Do we see this biblical truth of God's character, of how he's actively involved in our reality? And that in all things in the earth, he sustains it. He's keeping it by his divine hand and power. Do you think it's by coincidence that all of nature is operating in such a strategic order? Do you think it's by random chance that the earth and the moon are placed in a particular concise point that we can actually survive? Did you know that if the moon moves or if the sun moves just a, a less of an inch away from the earth, we will all freeze to death? Do you know that if the sun moves just less of an inch close to the earth, we'll all burn to death? Do you think that it's by coincidence that everything within this world and this universe is placed in a strategic order by random chance? No, it is our living God who is providential by his divine hands, upholding all things and sustaining all things. God cares. For you. <laughs> How does this encourage us? You may say, oh, I'm sorry. I, whew. He's also providential over the affairs of man. I got to get this out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, it says, The king's heart is is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wishes. Who? I want us to allow these things, these truths, and these realities to sink in within our very heart and mind <laughs> to understand the sovereignty and the providence of God. In verse 30 of chapter 6, but if, the, if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not clothe you much more? O oh, you of little faith. Hmm. I want to read this story. When the plane leveled off at 14,500 feet, Feet. Joanne Murray took a deep breath and jumped out of the door of the bank executive from Charlotte, North Carolina, was enjoying the free fall through the air until she pulled the ripcord for her parachute, and nothing happened. 
just about when she had an extreme rush of an adrenaline, but she didn't panic. She knew she had a backup parachute. She was falling 120 miles per hour when she released the reserve parachute. It opened just fine, but she lost her bearings and in her struggle to right herself, she deflected the parachute. While the parachute briefly slowed her descendants, she continued to fall at 80 miles per hour. She struck the earth, bump, with a violent blow shattered her side, jarred the fillings of her teeth. She was barely conscious, and her heart was failing. Just when it seemed things could not get much worse, she realized she had fallen into a mound of fire ants. that didn't appreciate her disturbing their solitude. All told, they, they stung her about 200 times before the paramedics arrived. But things are not always what they seem. The doctors that treated Joanne believed that the ants actually saved her life. They theorized that the stings of the ants shocked her heart enough to keep it beating. <laughs> How many of you know that oftentimes we try to do life thinking that we are in control? <laughs> that we think we have things all together, assuming that the parachute of materialistic gain and the parachute of self-preservation would save us. But it all, but all did, but all it did was to cause us to fall into the stings of life. But how many of you know that just as God is providential over the stings of the ants, God is providential over the stings of life. And it, and, and by it, those very things God uses to preserve our lives for us to realize who he is and that he is in complete control. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything of prayer, supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That the peace of God, what? surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, my brothers and sisters, it is important for us to understand that thankfulness is not derived from the results that we want in our situation. <laughs> but being thankful completely rests on God's eternal wisdom and plan for our lives and submitting our wills to him. Point number three. And I'm done. The kingdom of God should always be a top priority as Christ followers. The kingdom of God should always be top priority as Christ followers. It's interesting to note that the word he uses in Verse 23, well, I'll read it. Verse 32 through 33 says this, For the Gentiles seek after the things, after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When God uses the word, when Christ uses the word Gentile, it's not of racial distinction but is of religious distinction to convey that these religious people 
were more focused on their own selves rather than the one and only true biblical God. If we're living our lives to preserve ourselves, being materialistically driven about life, thinking that these materialistic things can sustain us, then we're just like the Gentiles. going to say this and I'm done being committed and devoted followers of Christ we should always put the kingdom of God first the word first in this in verse 33 doesn't mean first as of importance but it means first as of priority It says for us to not only seek the kingdom of God, but to seek the righteousness of God. We are not only to seek his kingdom, but we are to seek his righteousness as well. Here's the thing, my brothers and sisters. It is important for us to know that we have no righteousness on our own. And in this understanding, we ought to seek after the righteousness of who? God. Which is in Christ Jesus. So I, I want to say this, that through Jesus Christ, through his passive and active obedience, being providential in him fulfilling the law and every jot and tittle, and taking upon himself the wrath of God so that his righteousness can be imputed upon us. God cares for you. We see it in the act of the cross. His righteousness. He fulfilled every single detail, every single law, so that his righteousness his obedience can now be upon you. I want us to really understand this. The wrath of God was poured on his son. The wrath that was meant for you. The wrath that was meant for me. He poured it upon his son on the cross so that he can provide and give eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. God cares for you. We serve a God who is transcendent. But we also serve a God, the one and only true biblical God, who is imminent. That means he is involved in every single detailed area of your life. Every molecule, everything that you may think is out of control is in complete control in the divine hand of God because he is using you for his Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The antidote to anxiety is when we focus and put our eyes on Jesus. That is the antidote. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Because what? God I want you to make it personal. God cares for who? He is providential. Allow his providence to be the anchor in your soul and in your heart for you to have great assurance, thereby fueling you to seek his kingdom first. His kingdom, not your agenda 
not your agenda. No, life is not about you. You don't exist to serve your agenda. You exist to serve the one and only true biblical God. Stand up on your feet. As the praise team would come. They begin to give worship unto the true and biblical God. I want us to really understand this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Jesus continues to say, why are you worrying? Why are you worrying? Are you not more value than, the, than my creation? Do you not have more value than the birds and the lilies of the field? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Father God, we just thank you. We praise you. Allow your word to commit, to surrender. Allow your word to convict our hearts as we surrender ourselves to you. We thank you. Dear God, help us to understand that you are first priority. It's not about our lives. It's not about our agenda. But it's all about you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name.
all. He is Lord of all. It's important for us to really understand this reality about God. Each and every day we need to reevaluate ourselves. What am I living for? What am I pursuing? Why am I here? And I believe the answers, I know the answers, is directly within the Word of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added Let it rest as an anchor and be the forefront of the very thing that is on your mind each and every day. And be fully convinced that God's providential hand is actively involved in God cares for you. Dear God, I pray that you be with us as we go home with our families, friends, loved ones. I pray that you will continue to bring the truth and the reality that our life here is not to serve our agenda, but our life here is to be fully committed, radical disciples for you. Our existence is not to serve our agenda, but it's to put your kingdom first and seek after your righteousness that you provided in your son, Jesus Christ. Dear God, we just thank you and we praise you. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to make a quick announcement as you guys are making your way to the doors. For those who are in part of camp, I'd like for you to stay just a little bit. You can sit right here in the middle. If you're involved in camp, if you're a volunteer, or if you are an actual camper that, are, that we'll be launching next week, it's going to be an amazing time. So just for us to run over some details and etc., just stay a little bit after church. We're not going to be before you long, amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday evening. I love you.